Hello and welcome to YouTube's favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody that we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon now up and running. Three different levels there will get you access to our videos before anybody else, give you a leg up on the Kayfabe effect. And if you're a King Kayfaber, that top level you're actually sitting in right now, listening to us record, maybe filling in details that we miss. So we welcome you to look at that Patreon and see what level fits you. We are also working cartoonists. You see our bibliography here on the screen right now. The best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe is to buy our books. Ed Piscor's Red Room coming up on the start of season three, Crypto Killers. You can see the cover here for issue number one will be in your shops very soon. Subscribe to that one immediately if you haven't done so already. Hip Hop Family Tree, The Omnibus, collecting all of the Hip Hop Family Tree comics plus 140 extra pages. This one will be out later this year. It's going to be the perfect gift this Christmas season. Uh, oversized, gold foil cover. This is going to be beautiful. So pre-order that one if you haven't already. His other books include WYSIWYG, Hip Hop Family Tree still available in Treasury Oversized Editions, three volumes of X-Men Grand Design, and an omnibus of X-Men Grand Design. So pick those up along with the first two volumes of Red Room if you haven't already. My next book, Street Angel Princess of Poverty, up for pre-order now from Image Comics featuring the homeless ninja on a skateboard and collecting all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel Deadliest Girl Live, recently brought back into print from Image Comics. Get both books, you'll have the complete Street Angel series. My other recent books include Hulk Grand Design and The Plain Janes. So today we're going to look at Paul Galassi's Early Batman comics, issues 393 and 394 of Batman. This is from early 1986. I thought these were much older. Yeah. I've been looking at a bunch of Paul Galassi lately. I saw a couple of panels from this run. Picked them up at the uh, recent Ides sale. Super happy to add those. Had no idea they were 1986. I thought this might have been from the 70s. You know, In my mind, this was right after Masters of Kung Fu. Paul Galassi and Doug Mensch went over to Batman. Right. I was wrong. Such an iconic cover to me. Great color. I've, se I've seen that reprinted uh, a lot of times. And it's so evocative. You know, it, that like that's the kind of cover that you want on your, your book, man. Batman looking... Pretty freaking cool. Definitely the highlight figure. Uh, it has all of the hallmarks of like good design where there's a hierarchy of stuff that you're looking at. You know, like yellow is a, is a cheat tool, you know, to like sell you on oh, focal, po focal point. So you want to see Batman and you see that there's concern on his face. And then the secondary places that is cool blues, you know, and then you realize like, okay, he's got a lot of blades sticking <laughs> at him. Uh, he's framed by them. It's just, it's a fantastic piece of, uh, comic book art and uh very well designed the second one is a pretty boilerplate comic book cover yeah very uh i hate to say uninspired but you look at these two covers and one of them i think is really strong and one of them isn't yeah it's more more sort of an average comic book cover but such a pleasure the first time i uh looked at these comics first time i ever read these i start uh checking out batman like i'm Gonna be five years old in in you know eighty six at, at some point I think uh, born in eighty two four cl close to five uh, the magpie issue which is like four hundred one something like that is my first Batman comic and I pretty much read that through until Batman gets his back broken almost on a consistent basis uh, get the new a new copy every every single month with like little spurts here and there if something was uh, really popped that I didn't you know get to the grocery store early enough but batman had such a sweet spot in my heart uh, growing up and this is just before my time well me too but make up for lost time here this is also um Galassi had taken a, a tour away from comics doing advertising art and it feels like all of his this is a this is peak Glacy to me. This this it seems like all of his tools are at his disposal here. I'm glad to see like he's inking himself, yeah. which helps. And Mensch, a guy that he worked with quite a bit. I think they had a good working relationship. And let's just dive in, man, because this is mostly an art appreciation book for me. That's that's what it is, you know. Like Mensch is whatever. Like he first of all, he sticks on the book for a long, long time. Uh, the cool thing about Mensch on this, you can keep going. You know what's noteworthy to me is Shades of Watchmen already, which is another book that's going to be coming out in this time period, 1986. I feel like this that exact... Cold War was just dominant. Yeah, I feel like this story is. Uh, it could have been a Masters of Kung Fu story. There's all that kind of cloak and dagger and double triple agent stuff that that has kind of always existed, but uh, this is freaking Paul Galassi. Look at that two page spread. Gorgeous. Pulling out all the stops, like doing that, like no holding lines kind of shady. Like that, this is a, takes a lot of time. It's much harder to do this 
then draw the full square and draw the circle inside and stuff to do the shading like because you have to be considerate of all of that and it, it just looks like he's really like auditioning you know it's a contract year for for Galassi or something and he's he's pulling out all the stops also Doug Mensch with maybe Len Wein as editor is uh boiling down his writing you read an issue of uh, Masters of Kung Fu you're get you're getting some verbiage on, on the pages that is a no go at DC Comics uh, yeah. at at this stage, and Mench is boiling down his his dialogue uh, to to fit this to make it a more pleasurable read. Because to be honest, the Masters of Kung Fu stuff not that fun to read, man. My uh, big disappointment in this book: the first scene takes place in Venice, and I was so excited. I went there last year and loved it. One of my favorite things I've ever seen. And uh, not a lot of Venice. I feel like he got a couple of clips from a National Geographic for uh, these background buildings. They look super cool, but it's not the sense of Venice that I was hoping for. But it is this Cold War espionage tale of like spies. And, you know, I mentioned the Watchmen Cold War on page one. He is teaming up with a Russian agent. So yeah. that's what we have. The stakes here are uh, plutonium being smuggled into the country to, to create basically a, a nuclear attack. Yeah, yeah. This page, bad storytelling, because uh, like... You're supposed to read it like this, then this. Vertical is always a struggle. And I think he could have solved that if this black wasn't there. Like, like if this was all gutter and these were totally butted up next to each other further away from these. You can do that. A bigger gutter would have helped. Yeah, because I'm reading this and then I'm reading this. Because it feels like it makes sense. It's the same color combos and stuff. But that's not the way that you read it. Because like, if you do, it's real silly. It's like there's extra time. It's like, <laughs> it's like here's the knife. He's looking... And then and then bats it because like it would have been hilarious if that was the order because the knife would be coming in like right here. <laughs> right yeah totally uh, and and you know what that might have that might have saved it like you know stop time like like uh, that Jiro Taniguchi fucking bullet comic because the other thing that makes it not work is the same size character where it looks like one second than the next so he fucked this page up in terms of storytelling. Look at this. Uh, you put something in the foreground in this case a spider web. I've seen people do like over the. You know, if there's a chandelier or something like that to create that depth from a top angle. Instant depth. And um, the shading, though, he's so strong in kind of like these moments. Like, this yeah. feels like the cinematic peak of a lot of Glacey's work, too, where it's just like cool image after cool image. It makes for a really fun book to look at and look at again and again. I wonder if he's talking to mention is like, I want to make this kind of story because, like, wouldn't you have liked to have seen him? do like Two-Face or, or Joker or somebody. You got this like dark rider guy who's just like the spirit or something. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying there. I actually thought of this as almost like their tryout book for the James Bond book that they ultimately did. Who needs to try out for that, man? Like, like low man on the total pool is getting movie adaptations and shit. Pre, uh, you know, the pre-generation, I feel like that was a high point. And I don't know if there were Bond comics floating around. Like, they might have been pitching. But it just felt like that international thing. Like, if they would have had their choice at this time, I think that's what they would have picked. I think I think it's their interest. You know, it's a story that's what that I they mean. were building with Masters of Kung Fu. It's, this is a Masters of Kung Fu story. Totally. And uh, the espionage starts with this sculpture that's, uh, they're trying to smuggle in this dark rider. This is romantic to me. Like, I always, you know, like, there was, in our lifetime, like, not too long ago, there was, like, an Edward Munch. Like, I think the scream got stolen, uh, got, got, got stolen from a museum in some big heist. And then there'll be all these articles about these black market uh, art auctions and shit. And to me, it's like the ultimate Groucho Marx, like, don't want to be a member of a group that would have me type shit like so sexy the idea that there are these like you know elon musk and fucking you know some some oil chic and shit like that or like in this room bidding on artwork that they could never show off to anybody yeah, right. for a couple of generations or something you know what I mean? like because it exists like you like when when those when those uh post-world war ii like all that oh, stolen yeah, artwork yeah. Has, has gone through that now and then one will surface and then it's like yeah, it's trace big, it back to the family it was stolen yeah from. That, like that stuff's a big controversy and it's just much different than like some oceans 11 stuff like you know five years ago somebody stealing edward munch and putting a kayfabe one up and like people not noticing for a little while uh and and doing something like selling it you know they're not just like holding on to it for a couple of generations there are people who are buying it and it's like what is that what is that world i'm so fascinated if there are any documentaries or books about that like let me know because that's something this is hitting a sweet spot for me i'm very curious about that too because in my mind that that can't really exist right. and if it does i want to I, I would be curious about that you carl stevens works at that museum in boston or wherever where like the biggest art heist of all time was and there are podcasts on it where like none of that stuff has surfaced they've never tracked down one piece of stolen art or anybody that they think did it you know yeah. and i mean it's it's 
so much money. <laughs> like, you know, people have been working on that round the clock pretty much. And it's just like, it disappeared. It just went into somebody's secret archives and it is secret. <laughs> so I don't know if you can auction this stuff off or not, but if so, yeah, I'd be curious to hear more about that as well. Yeah. Cause, cause wouldn't the guy who loses that really wanted Edward Munch's the scream, wouldn't he be a bitch? And be like, you know what? I was at this auction and fucking <laughs> Elon Musk, that douchebag outbid me on, on this Van Gogh that I wanted. Yeah, yeah, he might. <laughs> he might not. He might turn him in. How great Batman is going to bid $5 million for this thing. They're all doing up to a million bucks. And uh, as soon as he does, they're like, yet. <laughs> yeah, they're taking it right off the Auction's over. Yeah. Because they're kayfabe. And they're, they, they're setting it up so that a specific guy gets it because they want to put... The, there's a bounty. It's a Trojan horse. They want to put the bounty into the hands of some guy. It's almost math the way he composes stuff. Yeah, you know, like all these characters in the different planes with Batman in the middle. He's he, Glacey's kind of unequaled in certain ways with this. I, I look at a lot of this stuff and I think about Steranko, one of Glacey's primary influences. I kind of think Glacey's better at straight comics than Steranko when I look at certain of his works. Here's what he's bringing to the table, especially in a story like this, also. Uh, the, this was, uh, Storenko's built in, of course, but, uh, the strip work of Al Williamson mm -hmm. on Secret Age of X9 and things, yeah, I think they, call. I think they are using the same materials, which would be a lot of projection and tracing for those backgrounds and stuff. Another great piece of like the super foreground object, you know, yeah. put this hand in with a gun and now you've got all like another layer. You've created 30 more feet of depth right there. Totally. And, and like the big secret of this kind of stuff, you know, when you're coming up and you're trying to figure stuff out and, and learn how to draw and all this, like he fully cribbed that. I'm certain of it because it's so accurate and so perfect. And you can do that, you know, like uh, when Wally Wood's talking about like, don't draw what you can trace kind of stuff. What these guys will do is create a basic kind of collage of all kinds of found resources. Yeah, that car, you know, the background street. Yeah, and then you turn it into a Paul Galassi piece of art. That is the art of it. And that is where things are divorced now. Like with, with modern comics, with, with the tracing of stuff, where it's so pixel perfect and all that, and it's so stiff and rigid, they're skipping this step of turning it into their own art style. And you can find examples of this stuff throughout illustration history. Like it's always been, that's always been illustration. Yeah. You yeah, know, finding reference and then folding that in one way or the other. Yeah. There's no reason to, on a monthly comic to sit down and figure all of that shit out. The amount of detail he puts into these shadows, like the little folds in the coats and stuff, man, I, I eat it up again. This is, I think a certain peak of glacy. Uh, you know, depending on what your love of Glacey is, like there, there's a version of this that's the peak. The colorist showing up in the proper way. I wonder if he's given notes to the colorist because there's so much smart stuff happening. The red in the background to kind of offset the blue. And I mentioned, you know, like some of the design choices here. You see this headlight in, in the first tier, the second tier, and the moon in your third tier to keep that circle motif going through. Yeah, you know what's real important with the circle motif is you have to break it. The, the circle is such a strong shape that if you have too much of the circle from from a distance you stare at it so you have to put stuff in front of it they even extended into the circle design of your helicopter that they're going to then take i love that the blue and the yellow simple colors man it looks good and part of it's this paper if this were on a you know a coated paper it would read a little different it, yes and, and uh the version i saw it had more of like a blue liney kind of kind of color and it's not it's not this you know this is this is this makes it sing uh-oh the editor ain't paying attention to duck punch <laughs> he's going him yeah that's a, that's a lot of this is almost like you're borrowing it's like word debt we're gonna have to have a wordless <laughs> sequence to, to offset this make sure the number of words makes it out in time oh man knife in the back again so good at depth with no real this isn't really perspective mm -mm. but no, it's, it's a trick fake. yeah it's, it's a uh, it's a great trick for adding that kind of depth and it does feel like these guys just wanted to have some fun. Like, now here we are in, in the Alps or something. <laughs> yeah, and, which is absurd. Anytime Batman's in daylight, walking around. Walking around, like a bunch of skiers yeah, in right. their parkas, and Batman's like on day three of no shower. They're used to seeing it too, man, because like, you know, that's where, you know, uh, famous actors will go to summer, to for winter break or they something. They do this one great trick here, though, where they're like, leaving him, you know, in the middle here. And he's like, uh, this bright snow does hamper my camouflage. I'm built for the night. And everybody's like, well, then perhaps, where did he go? Yes. <laughs> Got to give him his props for this stuff. Great spread here. The panel with the binoculars. Uh, when, he, when he's doing a kayfabe fight with this dude who turns out to be CIA. 
and while they're fighting, see, this feels very 007, doesn't it? Like a, like a set piece where they're fighting and the guy's like, listen, make it look good. They're watching us. And after he said that, you see the binocular panels to, to further sell that. Uh, the unevenness of the snow silhouette uh, on, on you know, the mounds of snow there that's uneven and, and mm -hmm. really cool. That's, that's great observation. It's such good shadow work. It's that noir that... that uh... Man, he, he's so good with that. And he's good at several things, so it's easy to have these things be like the fourth thing that he's great at. But yeah. It really ties together well it, here. It's so tight a comic that I, I'm i quite sure that they were working on it I much bet. longer than yeah, I think the, so. the average job guys. That or else he, he just did not sleep for a month yeah, while working on this. Like, there's precedent. You know, like, like Gene Day is a cautionary tale. Oh, yeah. It's not what you should do. I love the coloring on this sequence and into this page. Look at that red sky, just flat red. Yeah. So striking with all the cool blues and everything and the rest of it. And Batman's head being chopped off. One of the great splash pages. Like, what What a great... You know, if you're reading this, yeah, it's a dream sequence. But at the same time, it's Batman's head being cut off. Right. Like, in a way... In <laughs> a way, flipping through the air. How's this get by the comics code? <laughs> in a way, I mean, that should have been the splash. Like... Like yes. you, you could start yes. the comic right on that page. A, a big oh, part yeah. of like those writing workshops that we we participate in was like cut off anything that you don't exactly need. And to me, that's that's you open a comic and you see that. It's like how do you not read that? Yeah, it would have been killer, no doubt about it. And now we've got Robin showing up, and <laughs> Robin's a really strange fit in this world of shadows and, and espionage. And, and Robin's like and and uh, Paul Galassi artwork because I mean it looks like you know it's a nubile little twink in a little costume, and it it's very uh, exceptionally uh, gay. Very weird. And our Russian agent is loving being put up in 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 style here in America in this uh, deluxe suite. But then when Batman shows up, she can't give him any credit and is like, oh, trying to bribe me to come over to the American side. What a bitch to draw. Yes. Like, chandeliers freaking suck to draw, man. Ugh. But that's probably the best one I've ever seen drawn in comics. Yeah. His attention to all the details really well, well done. You know, you're going to get two pages here in this penthouse suite and it's like yeah you got to kind of put in the work yeah and it's and it's all like it all looks lavishly expensive like uh, one of the things with uh, bougie furniture no no uh hard edges you know all soft edges he, he does that in the artwork uh, i do think he's doing some of his own business here because like the perspective looks yes. way off it does look strange i was looking at that that seems questionable but he's still putting in these kinds of panels that are just attention grabbing on the page look at the attention even to the ceiling as, uh, you know, this is not a cheap room. This this is one of those pieces where I feel like the conceit... Like, this panel was built based on the reference he had. Because, like, that is so clearly modeled out, you know? Like, it's it's somebody... So, like, he made... And, and, and it's actually... It's a, sh it's a strike against, like, the reference user where, like, the reference is dictating your compositions and shit. And I feel like this is the strongest piece of this panel. And it's so well referenced that like he had to make it all work around this cool photo he had or something. I got no regrets on that page. Good again with the colorist. We're switching scenes. It's still nighttime. Could be tricky. No problem. Bring in some colors that weren't in our previous night scene. And down to the docks. It's such a cliche of these kinds of movies. Oh, totally. Another one of those perspective tricks of create depth without the real use of perspective. You're just basically, you've got a vertical panel here to fill of this guy running and her behind it, however the figures fit. I mean, it makes the argument, like, the, it's sound. Like, the, yes. the, the vanishing point is here. So the, the fun part about having the vanishing point on the horizon line is you can draw a fucking shoe this big. You have this guy, you have that girl. It, it is accurate. I love the cartoon building, too. Like, there's such a history of this going back into even, like, the Dick Tracy's or the undergrounds of, like, what the shorthand of a city building is. And that's it. It's a rectangle with some squares for windows. It, you know what's funny is, like, it's almost like the way computer sort of fidelity has increased and stuff. Like, where, like, the Golden Age one would have, like, three big yeah. windows. Mm -hmm. And then, like, as time goes by, maybe you put some more. But Glacey's here, and then, like, there'll be, like, the Eric Larson one that has even more windows per inch. You know, like, yeah. that's, how, that's how you gauge it. I love this use of just, it's, these are, they're buildings, but there's just the geometric black background. You know, it's almost like you could have done that with no background and just made it black or whatever, but you add the buildings just to kind of like sell that scene. It's a great panel. Yeah. It's another one that's posed out and then the background is kind of like figure that out later. You could, you could tell those ones for sure. 
let's let's destroy our storytelling with something that looks like it's part of the comic. Yeah, funny. Uh, talking head scene as we're trying to figure out how do we save the day. And uh, look at the Robin mask with eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. Just touching. Like, the mask doesn't quite fit right. Min Minula will lean into that, I think. Uh, like, like his covers for the head-bashing uh, Joker Batman, uh, Robin comics, that, that, that looks like that Robin. It looks really good here. No eyebrows. Sans eyebrows. <laughs> but the eyebrows, that almost feels like something you'd see in Brat Pack. You know, some kind of right. reconsideration of these superheroes. Um, good face there. That's pretty cartoony. The comedian. Man, and I love it going from like the fluorescent office back into the shadows of the night. It does so good with those shadows. Oh, he's built for that. Yeah, completely. I, I love doing these kayfabe things of uh, duct work and pipes because it's very, it's very simple. It's like a trick that you can learn real easy if you look at the John Byrne Terry Austin uh, X-Men comics where you just kind of grid it off and you don't even have to pencil it really. You just follow the grid and just like make shapes and here are like these three, four textures. So a lot, a lot of that in Red Room. I wish this spread was a little bit, I don't love this page as much, but I love seeing like these kind of small panels of just detailed figure work. Like man, there's so much drawing on these two pages. Yeah. Like stuff like that. That is Beautiful. super tough to compose, man. Cause, cause now he's playing with three point perspective and you, you, you got to get that character in the distance and it just, it all looks good. This kind of stuff too, like it's, it's a photorealistic style. I would say that he's employing for oh, the yeah, story for sure. and then to have figures running, it can be really hard to do that in a way that keeps that kind of realistic style you, going. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta make that stuff your own because a running pose is very underwhelming when you photograph it, even at the apex moments, uh, unless you're. Usain Bolt or something. It doesn't look that heroic. Or... Look at how much detail he's packing into one panel where we've got essentially five figures here, you know, and you go all the way back and it's Batman and his enemy in silhouette, but it's still five figures in this one little tiny, you know, ninth size panel. He is a storytelling dynamo. Love this too, of breaking this tier of panels. Yeah. Good use of an open panel, as Bill Griffiths would say. Did you know he's doing a uh, Ernie Bushmiller biography graphic novel right now? No. That guy's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing more work in, in age 70 than he did when he was, you know, 30. Yeah, really wild. Um, love this as a center center piece. And you know what, man? I remember Cable and Extinction Agenda, Jim Lee X-Men kicking down the door in the danger room. It looked a lot like that pose. Uh, we were talking about, like, you know, that's, that's something. It, it, it comes up in comics a lot. And there are many, many examples. Like, like the zine of that would be, That'd be a great zine. something to behold. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, I, like, I've I've been tasked with it three, four times. Yeah, and there there's not a lot you can do. It's kind of like this is the angle. In uh, in the third, it, no, the second issue of uh, Crypto Killers that's coming out, man. Like, it sort of ends with the 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 cops coming in, and the way most people play it, because Galacy's bound by his style here. So you can't get Looney Tunes with it. But like, personally, I like when those fucking doors kind of like a piece of paper kind of curve and bend out to kind of sell you on the impact motion. But if Galacy would have done that, it would have looked uncanny valley or yeah. something. There's a really good one in that gorilla storyboard video of a door being kicked off, but it is definitely the cartoony version where that door is flexing and stuff as it's, it gets kicked it's off. It's just the uh, easiest. Hinges. Yeah. It's just the easiest way to do it. The ending of this story is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Cause like the, the idea is that inside the Trojan horse is like liquid plutonium. That's right. Great panel. Like everybody in this comic is dying. Like, oh yeah. Like, 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 you know how it's like, you know, if you follow a story along, you got to stories with happy endings, just know where to cut it. That, that's that's kind of this story, because like everybody is fucking toast. This guy doused himself in liquid plutonium and he's acting like it's all right. And this chick ain't running fucking for the hills. No. He's touching all over her. He's touching all over Batman. Yeah, his plan is to jump into the reservoir covered in this liquid and then contaminate all of Gotham City's people, I guess. <laughs> I love this panel, but yeah, you're right. Story-wise, this is ludicrous. Here's another one of those good good two-page spreads. Anytime like you get two pages of him doing like this action fight scenes, they're really badass. Yeah, you know, that's like, true. It's, it's two pages that you're looking at and it's just filling your vision. What a what an accomplishment. It's it's you know, it's another example of like 
the writing just has not caught up to the artwork in comics and 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 really really you know hasn't except for like very exceptional works because this is this is little kid shit you know this is this is an inspector gadget story yeah with this kind of artwork so the divorce between words and pictures it's is far pretty far off one of the really tough things with superhero comics yeah and especially you know from from pre-2000 or whatever but it always feels like there's just conceits there that they can't overcome that that young reader you know yeah. whatever it is uh but to your point of the liquid plutonium splatters are just coming off as they're fighting i mean <laughs> like she's, she's got to be covered in this she better never get pregnant <laughs> Maybe maybe this is the Nuke Face origin comic, man. Now we make the announcement of don't drink your water. Scary because I feel like how many cities have had this announcement we, in the last couple it. of years. That's what I'm saying, man. It feels like that goes around quite a bit. But Alfred, got to get Alfred in here, right? If you're going to do a Batman <laughs> comic. <laughs> and more splatters, like just doused. If you did this comic, wouldn't you like start to fucking make him sizzle a little bit and get Ooh, kind of bubbly and shit? You know, like, because it's, it's very meager. You have his hair falling out, have his teeth falling out. It, it was like that, uh, that gr- like, like Nuke Face, whenever he, Nuke Face has that uh, hillbilly, like, drink some stuff in every panel, something new happens to him. Like, you know, a tooth falls out, an eyeball comes out, his speech pattern starts to fuck. Every panel, something new happens before the guy just, like, Yeah, there was some uh, grotesque stuff in that Chernobyl. There was an HBO show, yeah. Chernobyl, that was kind of a horror, practically like a horror show. To this day, And there kid, was some, some dark stuff with yeah, that. Yeah, to this day, kids are born with, like, weird heart conditions there. This is, uh, so now we've got, like, a chase scene going. And yeah. basically, it's a race to the reservoir, so it's kind of interesting to see, like, how do you speed up a style like this? Right. And there's some cross-cutting. The cops are racing there, so... You know, you're trying to do this cinematically, and look how close it is. Yeah, he's getting close. They throw, you know, they're cowboys. Yeah, man, you aim high, Batman aims low. And there it is, did right before. Look at this drawing closely. I love it. This is like, how do you do foreshortening comic book kind of stuff, but also in this photorealistic style that seems like it would prevent that? Because there's some real morphing going on with this arm, and to me, it works like you're, you're creating different planes and almost motion. Like we're seeing this hand at a different moment than we're seeing this part of Batman. Yeah, true. And, and like, you know, he does his own kind of like the lighting on this is weird. You know, like like that would have been lit probably. Uh, but, you know, Galassi does his thing. Also, these angles, too. Yeah. Whenever the uh, reference breaks down, sometimes you'll see some really creative drawing. You know, like this is not something that he had foreshortened a uh, photo reference for. Yeah, totally. And and that's that's also the thing that lets you know that like this dude for all the stuff we talk about photos that that is not pejorative. The guy can freaking draw. That's the thing. I like this stuff. This is the distortions that I like in figure drawing and superhero comics. Yeah. Where it's almost like now you're seeing the imagination of Glacy on how do you distort? How do you actually uh, do some foreshortening here? But drops him just inches. It looks like his fingertips are over the edge, which you know. For composition, got to show us the edge with this black shadow so that right. we know he is just right there. Could almost pull himself over there. And uh, and this is your last page. And you got to imagine, like, Batman and... Uh, they're they're going to spend the night together, right? Before she heads back to Mother Russia. That's what I'm saying, dude. So much tension in here. But, but for the kids at home, how about if Batman just puts his arm around Gordon and Robin <laughs> and they go, have a boys' night out? Let's have a couple drinks, fellas. So all these people, man, <laughs> are contaminated, except for these smart ones here. There are puddles of plutonium that they're essentially standing over. Just just vapors just coming right in. <laughs> Probably ruining their film as well. Yeah, right. Oh, so, dude, look at that, man. What do we got here? We got circulation numbers? Uh... Holy cow, dude. Average numbers of copies each issue during preceding 12 months... Take a guess. That's low. I, I did. I seen it. Seventy five thousand. That's not a lot. Wow. No, it's not a lot at all. Like when we talked to Rob Liefeld about New Mutants being like becoming direct market only, I think Marvel's cutoff was between ninety thousand and one hundred and ten thousand copies, and that would have been in the late eighties. This is eighty six, and Batman is struggling. Seventy five thousand. You know that that's that's uh, there are other numbers here, and it just can't be right. That that has to be something very specific. So average number of copies. This is um. Pre- this is your net press run. This is your total printed copies, 195,000. That has to be per issue. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your average per issue, 195,000. Okay. But I mean, like, these are way below, like, the Hulk numbers that I print in sure. uh, Hulk Yeah, yeah, Marvel, Marvel was eating their lunch. They really were, man. This is Batman. Yeah. It yeah. under 200,000 copies net. Probably. And under 100,000 copies sold. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and it's probably, you know, the top tier book at the time. That's true. Like, imagine. Everything else is. 20, 30,000, which, which is very curious because, I mean, we find those old comics, you know, you could find cool uh, oh, Teen Titans yeah, and stuff for like sure. that for, for in the dollar bin. This says the uh, the actual number of copies of single issue published nearest to this filing date, 164,000. They're plummeting. Yeah, that's pretty weak. Like, like from that's... your average of 195,000 over the last 12 issues, the most recent's at 164,000, which probably means the one that was 12 issues ago is probably 225,000. That's a... Uh... That's 2023 numbers for uh, the best of those big, big comics. That's wild. I can't believe those numbers were so low and I missed it. So Bigfoot was my life. Yeah. And, and probably the, or a couple years before this, Bigfoot would have been my life. Like, I, my five or six years old, this was the thing. Well, flip it, because this is my thing, dude. <laughs> the animal. I, I remember this one, too. The freaking mon- toy monster truck. Perfect. That, uh, And, and you got to set, set the time, because... There were always commercials for like the latest, greatest radio cars, like uh, remote control mm-hmm. cars. Like that was that was a big deal, but only one that had fucking animal claws. Yeah, these things would come out, and there were three per wheel. Yes, which which imagine triangles instead of <laughs> instead of circles for wheels. Because it was also plastic, so it's not even rubber. And the idea was that you're supposed to be able to um, overcome certain terrain. Mm-hmm. And what would happen is it would just topple backwards but the commercial the yes. animal <laughs> the animal nothing could stop the animal like burned it to my brain from That's age great. five you know like like uh the, it, like the advertising worked on me i did not have it i never had one remote control car them shits were expensive they yeah. were a hundred dollars back then i, I would always see them at radio shack would be like the the high-end remote to- control yeah, cars to- those are the ones that you would see adults with and they would even take gas those wow. things, man. They would be gas powered and go way faster. But like, there would be the whole aisle at uh, Kmart and stuff. And my, and my folks are just like, don't even look at that shit. You're like, don't even. You're never getting one of those. And then uh, you would get those for you know your aunt or something on Christmas. Will get you those like ten dollar ones that has a wire to the control. You remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have those. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? You gotta like walk with it, and it goes an inch. Per second or something. That's amazing. This uh, I saw monster trucks about this time, and it Me was too. like Bigfoot and USA One at the Civic Arena. Yes, I, I used to go to all the time. I have photos inside the tire that of, stuff. of OG Bigfoot that is like a, a pickup truck with big ass tires. Like like I have, yeah. I have photos with that one, like in the big tire. Like these ones, I like like what is that chassis? It's like custom or something. But like the OG Bigfoot. Was a fucking pickup truck. Yeah, it was a Ford that just had giant ass tires. And I, I, I was four years old going to see that thing. They used to be so like I watched a documentary on them from that time period recently, and like they would crush the cars and they would drive so slow because the suspensions yeah. weren't really built for what they were doing. So right. it would just be like, and then stop on the cars and then drive off. And it was like, yeah, it's the greatest <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> We're showing off oh boy. our Pennsylvanianess, man. I love this. these, though, man. I had a great time with those. Like I said, I've been on a Paul Galassi kick, and I think these are really top-notch Galassi. Yeah, great comics. So happy to read them. So happy to actually look into the cover of that first one, you know? Like, it, it's one of those rare instances where the where the uh, interiors, like, the, the cover, you know, and the interiors kind of line up. It's so good to have an artist that does both. Yeah. Because if you love this cover... You're in business, man. Open, yeah. b- pick it up, open it up, enjoy yourself. The other Galassi uh, Batman that we may want to look at at some point is the Legends of the Dark Knight Prey yeah. storyline, which I have, but I, 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 if I read it, it was years ago. Whenever you know, like whenever I got it, that story is a sequel to Batman Year One. So like they mimic the the captioning, lettering styles, and everything like that. I think that's a cool gimmick, but uh, I don't know how good that comic is because. I don't hear many people talk about it, you know, and you think if you did a decent Batman Year One sequel, right? It, it would. I just found out it was a sequel to Batman right. Year One within the last year, so you'd think that'd be pretty knowledgeable if that were uh, done well. You know, there's periods of Galassi, and that later period, you know, the fast, the fastball, <clears throat> he ain't Nolan Ryan. Good to go? Yep. Kayfabers like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. King Kayfabers at our Patreon are watching us stream this, this recording session live. And they're getting the uh, cheapest copies of these Batman comics that we're talking about on the aftermarket right this very moment. They're getting all the uh, videos delivered to them before everybody else. But 
Cartoonist K Fib is brought to you by the books that we make. So, Jimmy, tell the people what you have out there, dude. My latest book releases are Hulk Grand Design, The Plain Janes, and Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. My next book release is Street Angel Princess of Poverty. This is the cover to that. It'll be coming out early summer and uh, collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadliest Girl Alive, going back to the very first Street Angel comics 20 years ago. So it's been out of print for a while. There's also some comics that have never been printed that'll be in this collection. So pre-order that one now. now. And uh, also join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where I'm serializing uh, some more new comics there for the first time. Not sure where those are going to end up or when you'll see them other places. So hit me up on Patreon if you want to keep up with my latest and greatest. Uh, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus coming out later this year, man, collecting all of the existing Hip Hop Family Tree uh, comics, the big four volume set. Uh, but there is 140 pages of additional material that is collected inside of this Omnibus, 504 page book in total, enough, big enough to stun a burglar as uh, Neil Gaiman says, man, scoop it up, support the comic, thank you very much. Red Room is starting up in May on a monthly basis. Crypto Killers 1 is going to hit the stores in May. Every story completely self-contained. It's the last uh, Red Room miniseries, man, so save the best for last for sure. Uh, there are two existing trade paperbacks of Red Room on the stands right now. There are three volumes of hip of X-Men Grand Design and WYSIWYG is out there. Jimmy, what else do we have going on? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, fanny packs, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. Great ways to support the channel. Give them those marching orders and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.